Ever since men realized small objects hurled at high speeds could put other men down, there has been a constant arms race between projectiles and protection. Every advancement in weapons was matched with an equally ingenious development in armor. The first concept of a metal protective suit comes from the Bronze Age, when the Egyptians and their contemporaries developed scale armor, usually made of bronze, but also of other base metals. Centuries later, Greeks came up with the linothorax. Made with strips of linen and cotton layered over one another in the same way modern Kevlar is. But despite being resistant against arrows and sword cuts, it performed poorly against spear thrusts, the main weapon of the time. So bronze armor was still the ultimate protection. As years passed, blacksmiths created cheap and easy to make chain mail. It reigned supreme for centuries until crossbows made its way to Europe. And to overcome the piercing power of bolts, craftsmen developed something even more solid. Steel plates were more expensive and heavier, but covered the knight's entire body, as well as the mount. So the mighty knights, armored from head to toe, went across the country spreading deeds of gallantry and heroism worthy of a song. Steel plate armor stood undefeated for years, until guns were created. Firearms continued to dominate warfare into the early 20th century. The musket gave way to bolt-action rifles as technology advanced. It took time for commanders to realize that marching lines of infantry headlong into an enemy equipped with bolt-action rifles was just throwing their lives away. This era of history saw the grandiose scale and order of line battles give way to trench warfare. Tacticians and scientists on both sides of the conflict tried to come up with various ways to break the stalemate in the trenches. Among the ideas proposed on both sides was a return to armor. These suits of armor always looked ridiculous and were usually very unwieldy. Many soldiers today complain about having to low crawl in full battle rattle. However, a select few unlucky Americans in World War I had to wear the Brewster armor, 40 pounds of solid steel. Dr. Otis Brewster, the armor's inventor, was not a Tony Stark, but was confident enough in his creation that he volunteered to test it himself by receiving a burst of fire from a .303 machine gun. Brewster lived and said that the force of being hit was only about one-tenth the shock which he experienced when struck by a sledgehammer. While Brewster armor could stop most contemporary ammunition, it exposed the wearer's arms and legs to enhance mobility, which was a real problem. Whoever wore the steel suit could neither turn his head nor shoot in the prone position. The blocky helmet also made proper cheek weld and aiming impossible. There was no armor on the sides or back, since Dr. Brewster estimated that the extra plates would make the armor weigh a total of 110 pounds, more than what would be reasonably expected for any soldier to carry. Body armor for infantry was largely abandoned in World War I for being too heavy and impractical. However, when World War II came, heavy steel body armor saw limited use with the Soviets and the Japanese. The Russians issued 8-pound steel breastplates to their engineers, which were good enough to stop German submachine gun rounds. The Japanese made suits of small steel plates sewn into pockets on the front of the vest, which also had a special Shinto bulletproof charm on the inside. But it wasn't that useful. Meanwhile, the United States Air Force began to experiment with body armor for its pilots and bomber crews. The armor did not need to be as heavy as the infantry armor of World War I, which could take direct fire from a large caliber rifle, but it still needed to protect the wearer from shrapnel from anti-aircraft guns. Working in tandem with the British, the Air Force developed the flak vest, a cotton apron that housed steel plates sewn into multi-layered nylon. The new vest proved to be quite effective, reducing pilot and crew fatalities from shrapnel immensely. Sometimes, pilots would sit on their flak vests, since the majority of anti-aircraft fire would pierce the plane from below. Thanks to its distinguished performance in World War II, the flak jacket continued to serve in Korea and Vietnam, where it once again found service on the ground with the infantry. The Army's flak vest was a bearable 8 pounds, but was primarily made of nylon and cotton, without the small steel plates the Air Force used in its vest. Like its Air Force counterpart, this lightweight flak vest could only stop shrapnel. If it received a direct hit from a 7.62 per 39 mm, the primary round used by the enemy, the wearer would die. A push was made to integrate some sort of plate system in the armor to give it more protection. This resulted in the creation of variable body armor. The ceramic plates managed to stop an AK round, but it made the armor weigh 20 pounds. In the tropical humidity of Vietnam, this was a nightmare for many troops. 
According to Vietnam vet and author Stephen E. Atkins, no one wanted to wear the new vest because it was more likely that a soldier wearing the armor would die from heat exhaustion rather than an enemy bullet. Even in modern armies of countries that traditionally operate in humid tropical environments like Burma and the Philippines, heavy armor is often ditched in favor of lightweight protection. In the mid-60s, the DuPont Chemical Company was looking for a way to produce lighter tires with a similar strength to what they were used to. And while researching a new combination of polymers, chemist Stephanie Qualick created a material that would become a true evolution of body armor. A light, heat-resistant material five times stronger than steel. Kevlar. She didn't understand the fiber's protective applications at the time, but Richard Davis soon did. Richard was a pizza delivery guy from Detroit who kept having problems with armed people while delivering pizzas. After his pizzeria was burned down, Davis decided to change the lives of those who were in constant danger like himself, like the police. Davis contacted DuPont and bought some of the new lightweight tire material. Fashioning it into a vest, he tried selling it to police. To prove his product worked, he shot himself in the chest over 200 times over the course of several demonstrations. Eventually, the Department of Defense caught on to the idea and began issuing Kevlar helmets and body armor to replace their aging steel helmets and flak vests. These newer evolutions of military armor weighed 30 pounds and included bulletproof plates that were, at long last, capable of defeating enemy rifle fire while being light enough to move around in. Countless thousands of lives have been saved by Kevlar vests all over the world. The helmet, while not designed to take a direct hit from a 7.62 per 39 millimeters, can still save soldiers from grazing hits. Okay, a long time has passed since the discovery of Kevlar. And after a lot of research, ballistic fabrics have evolved a lot. And before choosing a ballistic vest, it is very important to understand at least a little about how it works. So, the main polymers that can make up a vest are Kevlar or Twerin, highly durable synthetic fibers in the Aramid family. They're both five times stronger than steel on an equal weight basis and heat resistant. When used in bulletproof vests, the fibers are interwoven and layered many times to create a web-like framework of many nets. When a bullet hits a Kevlar or Twerin vest, each layer of that net works to slow the bullet more and more until it stops moving. The resistant fiber layers end up deforming, but they also deform the bullet until it's shaped like a mushroom, which makes it even less penetrative. So if you're hit while wearing a Kevlar vest, you'll feel the impact across your whole body as opposed to only in the strike zone, the spot where you would have a bullet hole in your flesh if the vest wasn't there. The ceramic used in bulletproof vest armor has a different chemistry from the ceramic that knickknacks or bathroom tiles are made of. Body armor ceramic works by being harder than the bullet itself. Ceramic armor shatters when the bullet hits it instead of deforming like Kevlar or Twerin armors do. The shattering pieces of ceramic armor then absorb the incredible force behind the impacting bullet, which also shatters, deflecting all that force from the body. You also have to choose between soft and hard body armors. Soft protection goes from NIJ level 2 to 3A and protects against handgun rounds and up to 44 Magnum. I'll explain the NIJ levels further, okay? So, this kind is made with lightweight, ultra-strong materials like Kevlar, Twerin, or Dyneema. Are concealable and discreet, meaning it can be worn under clothing. And easier to move due to its lighter weight. On the other hand, we have hard body armor. Those are NIJ level 3 to 4. It protects against advanced threat levels like rifle fire and armor-piercing rounds. Usually made of AR-500 steel, polyethylene, or ceramic hard armor plates, typically used in overt tactical armor. These are equipment used by security forces, such as the military and elite police squads, in specific situations not necessary for an ordinary citizen. In addition, it is important to choose the right size. The vest you choose must fit your body snugly without squeezing you too tightly. A loose-fitting vest may feel more comfortable, but it protects way less than a vest that fits properly. Also, be sure you'll have full coverage. Your sides, front, and back should be covered by the vest for the best possible ballistic protection. Some bulletproof vests for sale provide only front torso coverage, but this isn't ideal. Remember, a bullet could come from any direction. To get the best protection along your sides, make sure the front panel is wide enough to overlap the back panel by 2 inches. There are several excellent quality brands to choose from. 
and each one has a different size table, so before choosing, know your measurements. Ask someone to use a soft tape measure and write those numbers down before buying anything. Another important factor is knowing the armor rating levels created by the NIJ, the National Institute of Justice. Each bulletproof vest or piece of body armor is classified under five protection levels. These levels have an A alternate that cycles upwards to level four, the highest protection level. This information is crucial because it will influence the vest's cost, size, weight, and fit. But remember, the highest rating possible isn't necessarily the best choice for you. What I mean is, well consider that most firearm situations are caused by handguns. So unless you know you're going to be up against heavily armed bandits, there's no reason to wear something heavier, more expensive, and that will lessen your mobility and comfort, like a heavy armor with ceramic plates or steel. Okay, we've covered the basics of vests and their history, but now I'd like to talk about some not too common types of protection. I want to start with the anti-armor piercing vests. And as the name already says, this type of protection comes with high density ceramics capable of stopping light armor piercing ammo. As many may know, there are already ceramic plates capable of stopping armor piercing ammunition up to 50 caliber. But despite preventing the projectile from piercing the user's body, the chance of death after being hit by a 50 cal is almost 100%. The problem, of course, is the energy transfer. The shockwave of a projectile of this caliber is so overwhelming that the trauma alone is enough to damage organs, bones, and other tissues like no other. It's a death sentence. But against caliber 762, this type of vest absorbs impact efficiently, very useful in war zones. Oh, and still talking about 50 caliber, just over a year ago, the Russians announced a super armor capable of withstanding this type of fire. But like many other information released by Russian state media, there is no real proof that it works. In my humble opinion, this suit can really withstand the impact of a 50 cal. Now, whether or not the soldier survives is a different story. There's also other types of vests that use ceramic protection systems different from the ones we've talked about so far. Instead of conventional ceramic plates, these vests use smaller pieces that sit between layers of fabric and follow the shape of the garment. Two well-known examples are Dragon Skin and Liba. Created in 2006, Dragon Skin is made from a series of ceramic discs placed in between the layers of the vest and resembles the arrangement of the scales of ancient Bronze Age armor. Liba is the short for Light Improved Body Armor. Created in the early 2000s, it uses flat ceramic spheres arranged side by side attached to a layer of polyethylene. Both types of armor are efficient, but according to tests carried out at the time, the Liba proved to be superior than dragon skin, particularly when hit by consecutive shots. What about the future of ballistic materials? Unfortunately, progress is still slow, mainly due to the high costs of research and also the limitations of current technologies. Still, new synthetic fibers are being studied, as well as new nanotechnology applications. As an example, there are researchers developing internal coatings and meshes made of tungsten disulfide nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, and graphene. In case you don't remember graphene, over a decade ago there was a lot of hype about it. Derived from carbon, lighter and stronger than steel, some researchers claim that graphene is 60 times more resistant than Kevlar and can dissipate projectile impact 10 times more effectively than steel. It is a material with a lot of potential and also with many possible applications. Currently, there are companies investing fortunes in graphene research, so expect to see interesting news in the coming years. Well, that's what I wanted to say about ballistic vests. Thanks so much for watching, and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button. See you later.